It's a pleasure to have a chance to speak with you. I'm, I'm going to be talking about a, a detailed research uh, project or set of research projects. But before I do that, I wanted to take a few minutes just to tell you one or two more things about the Tomcat Center. Because you've heard about the Innovation Transfer Program. You've heard from some of our great grantees. We do other things, too. And I just wanted you to be aware of what the Tomcat Center does. So. You've met Brian Bartholomew, Donica Sarlia, the center managers in the back here. You'll probably have a chance to speak with her as well. So we do things beyond innovation transfer. Innovation transfer is one of the programs we're really, really proud of. But we also give a lot of research uh, grant money out to faculty and therefore their students and uh, postdocs here at Stanford. So we've given out almost $5 million in research seed funding over the last six years. Um, you may find yourself uh, working on a project that's getting Tomcat Center funding. We have various educational programs which might be uh, of interest. So we have grants that we give for courses. You may be the beneficiary of that. We also have a summer internship program, uh, which is mainly for undergraduates, but we've expanded it for master's students uh, in the past year. So those of you who are in the MS program might consider that. We do various outreach activities, and you've already heard about the innovation transfer. So just to give you an idea of the breadth of sustainable energy research that we have funded, this is the last uh, five years' worth of grants. Everything from smart grid to uh, large-scale solar to uh, vehicle recharging, um, the electrochemical splitting of CO2. You've heard about uh, some of that with um, the Opus uh, uh, group uh, that you heard about with um, uh, Natasha. Uh, thermoelectric materials, and so on. So we cover a wide range of different uh, research areas uh, that we fund. We have a competitive grant program. Okay, the internship uh, program, we specifically focus on placing students with energy startups. Okay, these internships can be a little bit hard to come by. Get away from the feedback there. Uh, we have different companies. Um, they help uh, provide internships. We provide funding for some of them. Some of them is just um, helping with the placement. So we had a number of students take advantage of this last summer. We're going to grow the program again this coming summer. Um, those of you who are already thinking ahead about careers, maybe I'll try moving to this side so there's less feedback. In sustainable energy, we have various activities to help. I'll draw your attention to the resources page of the Tomcat Center website. We have a list of both established and early stage companies that work not just in sustainable energy, but things like sustainable food, water, and the environment. So you could take a look at that at the time that you're thinking about uh, internships and also uh, permanent positions. And we are involved in various career events and fairs, helping to bring in companies that focus on sustainable energy. So just wanted to make you aware of all of these things. Uh, we've uh, happily impacted lots of different students here. So this is just the uh, pictures of those folks who've been involved in the innovation transfer program, both the faculty advisors and also the grantees. You met three of them um, just a few minutes ago. OK, so that's it for the Tomcat Center. Check out our website um, or speak to Donica, Brian, or myself if you have any questions about it. Okay. Now I want to turn to some detailed research questions. Um, which is designing catalysts using layer by layer growth. So this is related to my own research program and my, my students in, in my, my research group. Okay, So you have heard all week about various um, concepts in sustainable energy and uh, sustainability. And so this is a vision, one vision for a future that might involve a lot of different sustainable energy uh, devices. So you might imagine that you're going to use the sun to harness a lot of the energy. It's a rich source of energy for us. Uh, we have things like photovoltaics that convert that into electrical energy. Um, that, that's a well-known uh, device. You might want to store that electrical energy. So we have things like batteries or supercapacitors. One of the things that, that doesn't get you that easily is a stored portable form of energy. And so uh, fuels, we love fuels. So you can actually take sunlight and directly convert it to fuels. You heard about this with Atasha's presentation. They're trying to commercialize the technology to do this. And this is called a photoelectrochemical reactor. So you could actually drive some chemical reaction from the sun, make some fuel that then you might store in some uh, containers, and then later you might run it to generate electricity. One way you can do that efficiently, for example, is in a fuel cell. So there are all kinds of sustainable energy devices and technologies that are important to this kind of future vision. You'll notice that this is a really busy picture. And the reason for that is that we have um, 
try to show that what makes up these devices is a lot of materials that rely on functionality that you get at the nanoscale. So there are all kinds of nanoscale materials that already make up these types of devices and going forward are expected to be even more important in future generations of things like photoelectrochemical reactors or photovoltaics or batteries. Okay, so I'm gonna, let me just go back here. I'm gonna focus on this technology here, which is taking sunlight and making fuel. And the simplest way to do that would be to take water, this is a simple case, not that easy to do, but the molecules are simple, and you produce oxygen and hydrogen, which is your fuel. And this is basically inspired by photosynthesis, which is also taking sunlight and generating, uh, taking in this case CO2, and generating your fuel, which is sugar, and also oxygen. Here we're gonna focus on this really simple case, making hydrogen. And the way you actually do that is, or one way you can do it is you can dunk two electrodes into some water, and if you design those electrodes right, you can take the sunlight, have one of, or both of those electrodes absorb the sunlight, so it has to be some sort of semiconductor that can do that, um, generate a reaction at one electrode that generates the oxygen, and the other electrode would carry out uh, the reaction to generate the hydrogen. I'm actually gonna be focusing on this anode which generates the oxygen here. So again, we're looking at this very simple reaction, but it's broken up into these two different electrodes that each carry out the other half of the reaction. But these materials are really, really tricky to make. People have known for a long time that this would be a great scheme, and they've tried for many, many years and even decades to make this. The challenge here is that this type of material, let's say just this semiconductor photoanode, it has to absorb sunlight because you're trying to make a photoelectrochemical cell. So it has to be a semiconductor with good absorption properties. It has to have electronic properties that are consistent with the chemical reaction you're trying to drive. It has to be a catalyst because you're actually trying to make the rates, rates go fast. Okay. So you need uh, it to be uh, catalytically active. And then you're sticking this in a solution where it's usually an acidic or basic solution where you're driving these chemical reactions. These things tend to fall apart really easily. So it has to be stable too. And it is really, really hard to find a material, one material that does all of these things. And people have tried and tried. So one solution to this is to nanostructure your electrode in such a way that you separate the property requirements for these different things. So for example, you might have this nanostructured light absorber. This would be your semiconductor. You actually want to structure it this way so light comes in. There's lots of material in this direction to absorb the light. But then when you generate the charge carriers that are going to drive the chemical reaction, they only have to move a small distance at left and right here. Then you're going to want to coat it with your catalyst, something that's stabilizing, and smack this thing all on a charge collector. And to make something like this, you really need fine control over the synthesis. These are not easy things to make. And I'm going to focus on how we make materials like this and devices like this. OK, so the material I'm going to uh, talk about primarily is manganese oxide. OK, so I should mention that it's already well known that um, a lot of materials will drive this chemical reaction. That's basically taking oxygen or water and, and producing oxygen. It's called the oxygen evolution reaction. But they tend to be really expensive things like ruthenium or platinum. Okay, so there's not a lot of those and they're expensive. So there's a real push to try to make these catalysts out of earth abundant, non-toxic, cheap materials. And one of the ones that's interesting is manganese oxide. It actually happens to be that in photosystem two, which drives a similar chemical reaction, the center here involves manganese. So it's what we call bio-inspired. Um, it's earth abundant, it's low cost. There are lots of studies now in the literature looking at manganese oxide, but it's actually a really complicated material. It can come in all different sorts of uh, phases and oxidation states. So when one synthesizes it, you have to be really sensitive to which phase is gonna be active. Okay, so that's the material we're gonna focus on. And then we have to have a technique that can fine tune the synthesis of it. And we have different ways of doing it, but the one I'm gonna tell you about today is atomic layer deposition. It's actually borrowed from the semiconductor industry. So this is a technique that grows films from the vapor phase in a cyclical process, step by step, where you pulse in one precursor, and then you pulse in a second precursor, and if you cycle through this, you can grow up all kinds of different materials one atomic layer at a time. It's been really successfully applied for semiconductors. The idea is, can you make interesting materials for catalysts for photovoltaics using the same technique called ALD? So 
it's really nice because if you think about that nanostructured uh, device I showed you, what you want to be able to do is coat your catalyst on high aspect ratio complicated structures. And this technique, and the reason the semiconductor industry likes it, it's great for that. It can code, this actually happens to be a catalyst that's coating a uh, sort of structured um, substrate here. Okay, so can we make it? And the answer is yes, we can make manganese oxide by this atomic layer deposition. We get nice crystalline films. We do all kinds of characterization to make sure that we have manganese oxide and what phases we have, because remember I told you it's complicated, you can get different phases. Um, we can get both this phase, the MnO and the Mn203, and turns out that they're, they're quite catalytically active. And the way we know that is we have to test them. So we make a catalyst, and then we have to test its electrochemical activity. And we do this by basically putting in those two electrodes that I told you about for the actual device in a much more controlled fashion. And we basically apply a voltage, and we look for current to flow. When a chemical reaction is being driven, you'll start to see current go through those electrodes. And so we use that as a measure of catalytic activity. So we do it electrochemically. So what we have then is a series of curves for our various materials that we study where we look at how much current is flowing through those electrodes as a function of the potential we put across it. So if we had the perfect catalyst, which does not exist, it would take 1.23 volts to drive this particular chemical reaction. But every material requires some extra potential to drive the chemical reaction. So this is going to be the thermodynamic limit, but we always have what we call kinetic losses. Reaction rates are not infinitely fast. And that causes you to have to go to a higher voltage before you start to see the current flow. And so the best material I'm showing here is ruthenium. That drives the reaction pretty well. It has what we call an over potential, the extra potential you need to give of a few hundred millivolts. This is what you have if you just have your electrode with no catalyst on it. It's pretty lousy. And here are our ALD catalysts of manganese oxide. They're pretty darn good. Actually, they're better than platinum, which is another well-known catalyst for this reaction. Okay, so we can make very good catalysts with this technique where we can coat whatever structure we want. Okay, let's get a little more sophisticated than just a pure manganese oxide. What if we mix materials? Maybe we could do even better. And here we rely on a collaboration with our theoretical colleagues. This is coming out of the group of Jens Norskov. Um, in chemical engineering in the SunCat Center, where they do density functional theory calculations of various different doped metal oxides or mixed metal oxides. And what they've shown is that if you take titanium dioxide, which is a well-known uh, material semiconductor for these types of reactions, and you dope it with little bits of various metals, including things like manganese, you can get better activity. Okay, so the things that are higher up on this plot are more active for this chemical reaction. But if you look at the calculations that they do, they have to have very precise amounts of manganese or uh, molybdenum or tungsten in the titanium dioxide. So how can we make that? Okay, so we have to have a fine control of uh, the thickness and also the composition. And it's actually really easy to make mixed materials with this layer by layer technique that I talked about, atomic layer deposition. So if we have a process by which we make one material, say this is manganese oxide, where we cycle in our two precursors, A and B, uh, and we have another process by which we can grow titanium dioxide by cycling in those two precursors, if we mix them in different ways, then we can get the mixed material. And depending on how often we mix the manganese and the titanium, we can get all kinds of different compositions. So you can see it's, it's quite straightforward. Um, of course, it's a little trickier to get it to have the, the desired composition, but we can do it pretty well. So this is just showing schematically. We can go everywhere from little bits of manganese and a lot of titanium to little bits of titanium and a lot of manganese. These are all oxides. So we can synthesize a range of compositions, and then we test them. We want to see how well they work for this oxygen evolution reaction. And you can see here that it's a very sensitive function of the composition. Okay, so again, we're looking at things that they come up faster in current, then those are more active. And things that you have to go way out here in higher voltage to get current, they're not as good. And you can see that what's happening here is the best catalyst is actually pure manganese oxide. And as you add titanium, it just gets worse and worse. We already know titanium dioxide is a pretty lousy catalyst, and that's shown. It doesn't show really any current here. Um, 
So this is somewhat what we'd expect. The more manganese you have, the better the reactivity. But if you look more carefully, and I've just extracted from that previous plot what the current density is at a given potential, that's sort of a sign of the activity. As we sweep across the composition, so this is pure titanium dioxide, this is pure manganese oxide here. You'd expect if it was just proportional to the amount of manganese, it would follow this diagonal curve here. But what we see is that there's this attenuation in activity at the lowest manganese concentration. So there's some interesting anti-synergistic effects going on here. Okay, so there's a suppression in activity at low manganese content. We have been trying to uh, hypothesize why that might be. One possibility is that when you get to too low of a concentration of manganese embedded in this titanium dioxide, you only have isolated manganese species, and maybe those aren't active. Maybe you need multiple manganese atoms near each other to be active. So this is the type of thinking that we put into um, trying to understand what the effect is. And we have some other ideas too, which I'll skip. Okay, another idea is what role does the thickness of that catalyst play? So if people don't think as much about the thickness of the catalyst, um, but we can grow different thicknesses very easily. So this is just taking a very porous support and growing more and more manganese oxide on it. And when you get really thick, this is 90 nanometers thick, you start to see these beautiful crystallites of manganese oxide. So what is the effect of the thickness? Well, it's, it's actually really interesting. So again, you're, doing, you're driving the same chemical reaction. If you have a very thin layer, 15 nanometers, that's here. And when you go a little thicker, you get the yellow curve, which means it's a better catalyst because it's coming up faster in current. So that's good. That's probably just because you have more manganese there. The more manganese you have, the more active it is. But then you'll notice when you go up to 42 nanometers, it's coming back down. And by the time you get to 90 nanometers, you have very little activity. So it peaks and then it comes back down. And what we think is happening is you're actually having charge transport limitations because you have to get your charge carriers through the manganese oxide to the solution to drive the chemistry. And if your film is too thick, you can't get them through. So it turns out that this is precisely what's happening because again, we teamed up with the Norskov group who did calculations. And we did a more controlled experiment where we took a bottom electrode and we coated it with increasing thicknesses of titanium dioxide, which itself is not a great catalyst. I already showed you that. So here we're just using the titanium dioxide as kind of a barrier to see how hard it is to get the charge carriers through this to this side where it does the chemical reactions. And you can see that it just gets worse and worse the thicker it gets. Um, I can plot this differently where I show the current as a function of the thickness. And I'm actually showing both the experimental data, which is in the blue here, and the results of theoretical calculations where they model this as tunneling through that uh, titanium dioxide layer. So you can see that you very quickly have an, lose the ability to get the carriers through to drive the chemical reaction. And surprisingly, with this system, it happens at four nanometers. I mean, these are really, really thin catalysts. Beyond that, you can't even get the carriers through to drive the reaction. So that was really interesting. The last system I want to mention very quickly is uh, nickel oxide. Okay, manganese oxide is a great catalyst. I showed you ways that we can control the thickness and the composition if we mix it with other things. What about nickel oxide? It's also earth abundant. It's also pretty cheap. And if you look at what's in the literature, a whole bunch of catalysts for this reaction, um, and I'm sorry, it's, I could see it's hard for you to read, but the ones that I've put boxes around, they all contain nickel. They're various compositions of mixed metal oxides containing nickel. So nickel is a constituent in many of the most active OER catalysts. So let's try studying that. Um, there's one twist on the reactivity of nickel, which is that it's recently been understood that iron, even trace amounts of iron, can really enhance the reactivity of the nickel oxide. And it's really easy to, well, it's not that easy to study, but it's easy to incorporate iron into it by making your nickel oxide electrode and then just putting a little bit of iron in solution and that gets picked up onto the nickel oxide and we can study the effects of that. So what we find are, are two things. Okay. The first thing is these are reasonably good catalysts. So again, we're looking at the current as a function of potential and nickel oxide is a reasonably good catalyst and it becomes a better catalyst when you add iron. So the blue is really very little iron and the purple is with more iron. Okay. So that's been known. But we also found is that you can do different electrochemical uh, study 
you can use some of the behavior to tell you how many nickel atoms you have or what the surface area is. And what we find is that, yeah, okay, iron makes it more active, but it also gives you less surface area. Okay? So when you add iron, you get fewer electrochemically active nickel oxide sites. So you're, in the one hand, you're helping, and on the other hand, you're hurting. So my student who was working on this, Katie Pickering, had this idea, let's get both benefits. So she developed a two-step process. First, you basically roughen the nickel oxide in the absence of iron to get a really high surface area. And then you add the iron to get the high activity. So this is this two-step process here. And you go from no iron to adding iron to the two-step process, which is a very highly active catalyst now, earth abundant, uh, cheap. Uh, components. Okay, so just a, that was kind of a, a quick overview of the types of studies we do and trying to do layer by layer nanoengineering of different materials, composition, thickness, different earth abundant uh, constituents to try to get good catalysts for this one particular reaction. Okay. So let me just reiterate, I think nanomaterials are going to be very important and they already are. They're going to become more important for energy conversion technologies. ALD is one technique that's really good for controlled synthesis of it. I gave you a number of examples ranging from manganese oxide to mixed metal oxides to this uh, problem with the thickness and all the way down to nickel oxide catalyst. Okay, finally, this work was done by really dedicated students and postdocs and collaborators. Most of the work was led by Katie Pickrun. She recently graduated with her PhD. Um, an undergrad, Aaron Garg, uh, various postdocs. Uh, we collaborated a lot with uh, Tom Jaramillo's group. He does electrochemical studies. Uh, and also I mentioned Jens Norskov's group for the theory. Um, anyhow, with that, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you. My name is Dante. I'm in the materials department. And I was just wondering in the nickel, or the most recent paper you showed with the nickel and iron, how does she roughen the nickel surface first? So these are all sort of pre-treated by cycling through, cycling through the uh, voltage, which you're kind of doing anyhow when you're looking at stability studies. And so if you do the initial cycling without adding iron, you get the roughness. And then later when you're cycling, you've already roughened the surface, you can add the iron in to get the good activity. So it takes up the iron after you've already roughened the surface. So it's all through electrochemical cycling, basically. Yeah. Hi, I was also wondering about the nickel oxide with the iron. Um, when you say you found that the surface, the active surface area was less, uh, less in the case with iron, the earlier uh, plot where you show higher activity for the iron, was the current density calculated per area of the electrode? Or yeah. I, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's a great question. So one of the, so what you'd really want to do is have the activity per number of sites, right? Yeah. That's hard to calibrate. So what's more commonly done and what was done here is just the um, current per geometric area. Okay. Okay. So that means your, your electrodes like this. So if it gets really rough, you know, it will look more active because you have actual more surface area. So what we do is we, the way to get around that is to calculate the turnover frequency or turnover number, which is basically how active each site is. And we've done that as well. So we, you can sort of extract that. But you're, that's why the data looked the way it did. It's per geometric surface area. Hello, um, I'm Jenny, also from the Material Science Department. I was wondering, in your um, the graph showing man manganese oxide versus platinum, was the platinum electrode, or platinum was the catalyst that was coated on the electrode? Mm -hmm. What was that material, and also was it also nanostructured? Uh, that platinum was not intentionally nanostructured. It's probably just a polycrystalline platinum that was deposited on the same type of electrode, under underlying electrode. So, so it's so a both film of, the, of platinum. The, both of the electrodes were nanostructured and manganese oxide was coated onto that and platinum was coated onto another one that was nanostructured? Um, 
so in that comparison between the ruthenium, the platinum, and the manganese oxide, those were all ostensibly flat. Oh, okay. So we take a flat, not really flat on the nanoscale, but flat uh, substrate, and then we coat on top of it the different materials. So the nanostructuring really came later. We have a, that was not shown in that data, but we have a way of making our electrode very nanostructured and rough, and then we can also coat on that. But that data was trying to do an even comparison between the different materials. But you're absolutely right. If the platinum or ruthenium happens to go down really rough, and you're doing it, measuring it per geometric surface area, it's going to look more active, right? That's always the problem with these comparisons. So the, the true way to do it is to figure out how many active atoms you have and look at what the activity is per, per atom. That's the turnover number. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering what, um, if any degrade degradation you've seen in any of these catalysts that you've made, if you've done any studies about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not been that great. I mean, so the degradation has been bad, is, let me put it that way. So that's always something you need to look at with this. And um, we have not yet solved that problem. It's a problem with most of these catalysts. If you look, so you do long-term studies and you look at the stability. So how does the activity behave as a function of time? And these go down on the order of hours at best. Um, so part of the problem is with these particular materials is we're growing them really, really thin. So the adhesion is not that good. Um, one would need to develop better ways of getting good adhesion of the materials. And, and most of these processes, and this is, comes back to the nickel oxide, they really roughen and they change, the morphology changes. We can grow very, very smooth manganese oxide. And as soon as we start doing electrochemistry, it looks completely different. And so part of that is the material. That's not going to matter how you put it down. There's the reconstructions that take place. And part of it is, can we come up with better ways of putting the material down? So that's really the next step once you get a really good catalyst, is to make sure it's stable over long, long periods of time, not hours. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think is the biggest challenge to commercialize this uh, catalyst? Uh, the challenge. Well, um, there are a number of challenges. I'm told this is the last question and answer, so let me, let me try to be somewhat quick. Uh, there's still some materials challenges. So we know we have good materials that can do it, but they're expensive. So that's part of it. So getting good activity. I think we have materials that are reasonably good. We still want them to be more active. Stability is a big issue. Okay? They have to last a really long time. And then this, this uh, design idea where you have one material coating another, that really needs to be implemented. Because what I'm showing here, these are good electrocatalysts, but I didn't talk about the light absorption in these catalysts, right? You still need to have something that absorbs light. These do not absorb the light. These would have to be the coating materials on something else. And so integrating the semiconductor core with this catalyst uh, coating, that still has a lot of materials challenges. Um, so that's. That's part of it. And there are lots of other commercialization barriers as well. But from the materials perspective, those are some of the challenges. Yeah. So, OK. So uh, with that, I'm told to get off the stage. And uh, OK, I will. <laughs>